Hi, and welcome to this talk on using Identity Server 4 with Entity Framework and ASP.NET Identity. My name is Kevin Jones from Rock Solid Knowledge. So in a previous talk in this series, we looked at installing Identity Server 4 and using in-memory stores. We wrote an API client and we wrote a web client and we showed the web client calling the API. In this talk, we'll update that instance of Identity Server to use Entity Framework stores. And we'll also update Identity Server to use ASP.NET Identity. And ASP.NET Identity is used for its user store. In other related talks, we'll also look at how we take this instance of Identity Server and install that on Azure, and also how we add admin UI to that instance of Identity Server on Azure. Okay, so let's get started. So previously, we created an instance of Identity Server and we'd added in-memory clients and resources and scopes and test users. And these were also in-memory. What we'll do now in the first part of this talk is take away the in-memory clients, resources and scopes, although for now we'll leave the test users and we'll come back and remove those test users a little later on in the talk and use ASP.NET Identity to store those users. So to use Entity Framework, I need to add some packages to the project. So I go to Manage New Get Packages, and I want to add four packages. The first is Identity Server 4 dot Entity Framework. I also want to add the Diagnostics package for Entity Framework Core. I'm going to add the Tools package for Entity Framework. And finally, as I'm running this on a Mac, and I'll be using SQLite, I'll add the Microsoft Entity Framework Core SQLite package. And you should add the appropriate package for whichever database you're using. So we'll need a database connection. So for that, I'm going to add a connection string into my app settings file. So in here, we'll have a connection string section and my data source is called identityserver.db. Now remember, I'm using SQLite here. So this will be a file that gets created as part of this project. And then in my code, I can get rid of all of these calls to add in memory clients and scopes, etc. I need to leave the add test users call there and the add developer signing credentials call, but the rest can go. So now that we've got rid of the in-memory data, we'll use a database. And to use that database, we'll use Entity Framework. And with Entity Framework, we need to create some contexts. And those contexts have to be configured. And part of that configuration is the connection string. So to get the connection string, we need access to the configuration stored in appsettings.json. And to do that, we need an iConfiguration instance. And that is injected into our startup class. So inside startup, I can add a constructor. And into this constructor, I'll pass these two values, the environment and the configuration. And then for each of these, I'll add a property to capture that value. Then inside configure services, I can use the configuration to get the value of the connection string. And remember, I call this default connection. Once I have that, to my services, I can make a call to add configuration store. And this is an extension method provided by identity server 4 .entity framework. And this takes an options. And in that options, I have to configure my DB context. So inside here, I say options dot configure DB context. And to this, I use a builder. And this is configured with a function. And that function takes a builder. And we use this builder to build the DB context. So on here, I'm going to say use SQLite. And the call to use SQLite takes a connection string. Along with the configuration store, we also configure something called the operational store. And we configure this in the same way. Now, in a moment, we'll use this code to create and run migrations. If you do that, and you get this error, then you need to tell Identity Framework which assembly is hosting the migrations. So if you do hit this error, you can change your code to look like this. Where we call configure DB context, as well as passing in the connection string, there's a second parameter to this, which is also an options. And on this, you call the method called migrations assembly. And to this method, you pass the name of the assembly that hosts the migrations. So for that, let me add a variable called migrations assembly, which gets the name of this assembly. And we can pass that parameter to my use SQLite call. So let me also add that code to the add operational store. And then I'll rerun IDS just to do a rebuild. So now that we have that, we can create and add these migrations. And I'll do that from the command line. So if I go to my shell here, 
We'll do this first of all for the operational store. And that DB context is called the persisted grant DB context. So I run this command, .NET EF migrations add, and give it the name of the migration files and the name of the DB context. Then it creates the migrations for me. And if I go back and look in Rider, we now have a migrations folder. And in here, we have the migrations for the persisted grant DB context. I can then do the same thing for the configuration store. And again, if I go back into Rider, we now have migrations for the configuration database as well as the persisted grant database. If we notice in here at the moment, we have these files, the various app settings files and the various CS files, but there's no DB file here at the moment. Remember, if I look in app settings.json, my database file is called identity server.db. So to create that file, I need to run these migrations. So to do that, again, I run .NET EF. This time we say database update and we tell it which DB context to update. So first of all, we do it for the persisted grant DB context, and then we do it for the configuration DB context. And again, if I go back into Rider, I'd open up the Explorer, we now have an identity server.db file. If I open my database viewer, and drag this file across, and look inside here, we have a main schema that contains the tables that are used by identity server. And if I browse to well-known OpenID configuration, we can see again, we have this discovery document, but again, things like supported scopes has hardly anything in it and the supported claims is empty. And that's because currently the database is empty. So the next step is to take the data we had previously and add that data into that database. So we said in the previous video, that one way to create an identity server instance was to use the templates. And if you use the templates, the templates come with a mechanism to seed the databases with data. And I'm going to borrow that mechanism. So from the template, I'm going to paste in this file called cdata.cs, which has a class called cdata, which, which has a static method in it that will just add data to the database for me. Now notice at the moment, this is so showing some red. And this is because this is using Serilog to do some logging for me to output some information about the process of seeding the data. So to fix that, I'll add Serilog to this project. So again, if I go to the NuGet tooling for this project, I want the serilog.aspnet core package. And we add that, bring in the references, and this code now compiles. So to use this, I need to do two things. I need to configure Serilog, and I need to execute that seed code when asked. We do both of those from inside my program.cs. So first of all, inside main, I'm going to add a very simple configuration for Serilog. And then inside here, I'm going to look at the passed in arguments, check to see if there's a slash seed argument. And if there is, run the seed code. And if there's not, just run the normal builder code that we can see here. So that code's going to look something like this. Let me get rid of this call to create host builder args .build run. So I check to see if the if slash seed is on the command line. And if it is, I go and grab the arguments that are there except for seed. I then create a host object by calling create host builder with whatever arguments are left. If seed is passed, we put up a message saying we seed in the database, we get a connection string, and then we call ensure seed data on the seed data class passing in the connection string. And we'll see what that code does in a moment. If seed isn't passed, then we just start up the host by calling host.run. I notice now in my code, I'm returning an integer. So we need to change the return type of main to be int. So what does ensure C data do? So it makes sure that the DB context is configured correctly, again, using SQLite. Then if it is, it takes our test data that we had inside the configuration. And for any test data that's there, it adds that test data into the database. So it says, do I have any clients? And if we do, add those to the DB context. Do I have any identity resources? Do I have any API scopes? And do I have any API resources? And for any of these things it finds, it populates the database tables with that data. So we're using the same data here that we used previously for the in-memory stores. So again, let me build this. And then from my shell, I want to run this command. I'm doing a .NET run against IDS, and I'm passing it the slash seed command line argument. And if I do this, it will take my data and seed the database with that data. So now if I go back to identity server in the browser and look at the discovery document and refresh, then we now get the scopes and the claims 
from the database. They were added by the seed. And these are the same scopes and claims that we saw before when we had the in-memory data. We can also see if I go back into Rider of my database, open up a query console and do a select star from clients. We can see the two clients have been added, for example. So the m2m.client and the interactive client. So now we have everything in the, in the database apart from the users. And for that, we need to update our code to use ASP.NET identity. So let's do that next. So ASP.NET identity provides a mechanism to help us manage users. So at the moment in our code, we have test users and those users are stored in memory and we'd like those users to be stored in a database. So to do that, we need to add ASP.NET identity to the project and then to add a DB context to the project for ASP.NET identity, create a migration for that context, apply the migration. And then we also need to update some of the quick start UI so that it works with ASP.NET identity rather than with the test users. So let's do that now. So the first thing to do, if I go into the project and manage new get packages and add the identity server for ASP.NET identity package, and I'll also need the ASP.NET Core Identity Entity Framework Core Package as well. Okay, so once I have that, I need to add another DB context into my startup. And the way I'll do this is to create my own class called Application DB Context that derives from a supplied class, which is the Identity DB Context. And that will give us a bit more flexibility if we need it in our code. So within the project, we create a new directory called data and in here create a new class called application db context. And that class will derive from identity db context and we'll provide a constructor for this class as well. So now that I have that in startup CS, in the same way that we added the db contexts for the identity server stores, we can add a db context for ASP.NET identity. So we add the db context by calling add db context, passing it the type of the db context. We pass the connection string for SQLite. And again, we also specify the assembly that we're going to use as well for the migrations. Once we've done that, we have to configure ASP.NET identity. And we do that by calling add identity. And add identity takes two types. It takes the type that we're going to use for the user and the type we're going to use for the role. And for this, we're going to use the built-in types. So it'll be identity user and identity role. And if you need to, you can derive from these types and provide your own type. And then finally, on this, we call add entity framework stores and tell ASP.NET identity which DB context to use. And of course, that will be that will be application DB context. So that's identity configured here. So now what we need to do is to remove the call to add test users. So we know as we will no longer be using the test users. And instead, we replace it with a call to add ASP.NET identity, specifying the type of the user, which in our case is identity user, i.e. the built-in type. So we're telling identity server to use ASP.NET identity to manage the users. Okay, so if we build this code and go to our shell, from here, we can create the migrations for this DB context and run those migrations. So again, we run .NET EF migrations add, and this time we pass it the application DB context. And then once we have that, we can run a database update against the application DB context. If I go back to my database and do a refresh, we see now we have a set of ASP.NET tables in here as well. So tables to manage users, roles, and user claims, for example. Okay, so with that in place, we need to update our seed code. Because currently the seed code doesn't add users to the databases. So the main changes in here is really in the configuration. So I add the application DB context. I set up identity again in the same way with the identity framework stores set correctly. And then I have a method called ensure users and ensure users creates two users and adds them to the database. One of the user called Alice with a different password now, it's pass123 dollar and another user called Bob. And again, with the same password. So let me build this again. And to be on the safe side here, I'm going to delete the database and then rerun all the migrations and the C data to make sure it's fully up to date. So to do this, I'll update using the persisted grant DB context, then using the configuration DB context, and then using the application DB context. And then finally, we can seed the database. 
So going back into Rider and looking in the database, and if I run select start from ASP.NET users, we find we have two users, one called Alice and one called Bob. Okay, so now that we have that, we have one last thing to do, and that's to update the quick start code. So the quick start code uses the test users within its UI, and we need to change that so that it now uses ASP.NET identity. So there are a few places where these changes have to happen. The first place is within the account controller. So I go to quick start account, account controller. In here currently, we are past the test user store, but we'll no longer be using that. Instead, we're using something from ASP.NET Identity called the sign-in manager. So we pass a reference to the sign-in manager in, and we need to tell this which user type to use, so that will be the identity user. And we'll just call this sign-in manager and assign it to a local variable. And then we'll just get rid of this usage of the test user store. So this users is no longer valid, so we can delete that. And we replace this with code that uses ASP.NET identity. And that code looks like this. So we use sign-in manager to find the user by name, and then we check to see if that user is valid. So we check the user's password. And notice down here, there are a couple of things we have to change. So subject ID becomes ID, and username becomes username, but with a different case. And we also need to change the external controller. So this is used when we do a third party login. For example, if you're using something like Google Authenticate. And again, there are a few changes in here that we have to provide. So notice here, we still have a test user store, so we no longer need that. Instead, we use two things. We use a user manager and a sign-in manager. Again, both from ASP.NET Identity. And let's get rid of the test user store and get rid of test users. And make sure these two values are assigned. So the first change we need to make is in auto provision user. So there are a few changes here. So first of all, I want to make this async. So it'll be a task of, and it's no longer going to be a test user. It's going to be an identity user. And then my code will look something like this. So we create a new identity user object, ask the user manager to create that user, and then try and call add login async to that, and then return that user that we've just created. And then we also need to change this find user from external provider. Again, rather than being a test user, it's going to be an identity user. We're also going to make this async. So again, it'll be a task of this return data. And in here, the change that we'll make is rather than calling underscore users find by external provider, we call underscore user manager find by login async. So to complete this, we need to await these two calls and again, update these values. So that will be ID. And again, this will be username. The same here, so ID and username. And now we're good to go. So I need to rerun Identity Server. We go back to the browser and browse to the site. We get taken to the login page. And here I use Alice. But remember, the password has now changed. It's pass one, two, three, dollar. So if I log in, we again get asked to grant permissions. I say allow, and we're back in again but we're now using ASP.NET Identity to manage the users. And I know this, I have just entered the other password here, the pass one, two, three dollar password. So we've now been through the process of setting up Identity Server using in-memory stores, adding clients to that, so we've added an API client and a web client. We've then moved that to use Entity Framework, and then we've moved that further on to use ASP.NET Identity to store our users in the database as well.